Well, all right, all right, all right, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Planet Gen X podcast. I'm Sean, and that over there is Brian, and we are so happy that you guys joined us today because we are now embarking on a new journey. It's a discovery journey. It's a Star Trek discovery journey, and uh, they they decided to fuck us right from the get-go, man, and, and, <laughs> and stick two episodes on us. So we right. had to work doubly hard in one week, and you got like potentially, well, double the content for sure. And depending on how long it is, I, we have no idea yet. So but that remains to be I seen. Kind of predicted this, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> I did. It, it's common. I was scared this was going to happen, but uh, I didn't even notice the second episode. What till the next day? Yeah. I'd already sent you the first one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but before we get into things, guys, please remember to hit that subscribe button, the like button, the dislike button, if you really just don't care for it. And, uh, you know, uh, leave us a comment or something. We'd like to interact with our, our listeners, our followers, and we hope you become a follower. So click on it. Do Make it, it so. <laughs> All right. So, wow. I got to say. I've already said before that the 32nd century has definitely helped discovery. Right. Um, we come right in the right out of the gate. Uh, by the way, this episode is called Red Directive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we come right out of the gate with uh, Burnham basically surfing on a damn uh, a ship. We don't know whose ship or whatever. But it's obviously at warp, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's obviously at warp. She's on top of it, man. And I just don't know about that shit, dude. I, I'm, I, my bullshit flag was thrown in the air when that happened. I'm like, man, it, it just, I, I don't know. It seems a little much. It does. Be on, I agree. To, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone in that because I wondered if I was just being too hard. But I'm just like, come on, man. A well, ship I mean, at warp. In theory, and, Right, it's a warp bubble. Yeah, so she's in the bubble. She's within a bubble, but, but she had to break time... the bubble. That's what get. That's because I had the same thought. I was like, "Yeah, she's in the bubble, but she had to break through that bubble." Right, and that I have an issue with. Yeah, big time, a big time. Because basically, I mean, she's in a she's in her own spaceship, which I, I believe I have down in the notes later. So I'm kind of ruining it already. <laughs> <laughs> who cares anyway uh yeah anyway so uh you know we it's the uh, federation millennial anniversary give or take a few decades they say uh and we get a jump just stick reference in this scene which was pretty cool i love i love old references especially to ds9 uh we also see the same go i'm sorry <laughs> almost wanted to go smoke when i heard that oh yeah i know right um we also see the same species as morn from Deep Space Nine, which used to be the old bar guy that used to sit there all the time. Who, uh, for those that don't know, is uh, do you call it an acronym of Norm? From he was, it's just his name backwards, Norm. You know, from Cheers, it was an homage to Cheers, who had uh, just you know finished their last you know season or something right before they went on or something. I can't remember, but it was an homage to him anyway. Yeah. Um, Stamets is upset. The spore drive program was axed in favor of the pathway drive. Now, he's not upset. He, he, you look at him, he is not upset. He is just sad. Yeah, well, yeah, he's pouting. <laughs> but I couldn't remember what the pathway drive was. And it's only because I just don't study Discovery. I mean, you know, the, the, if this was a show I really liked, I would have watched the season before, before right. this season came out and been up to speed on everything. And I just don't give a fuck about Discovery that way. So, yeah, I don't remember what Pathway Drive is. Shame on me, I guess. Do you remember? Uh, I mean, like, I'm sure if somebody started describing something, I would pick up points because because there are things I'm I'm not fully aware of. But no. Well, I mean, it's obvious it's their new tech and they've, right. they've got it on some ships, but not on others. We'll get to that. Um, I think yeah. it. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, I, I think it. Uh, I think it was mentioned like not not even before last season, but before that. Right. It, it very well could have and, and that may be why it is even worse that i don't remember it yeah. yeah but uh i'm not sure i ever liked the idea of uh the instant jumping discovery anyway so i'm kind of glad they killed this off 
to where they're saying, okay, no more spore drives. Good. I mean, um, it was a cool idea. It was an interesting thing to see conceptually, but yeah. as far as storytelling goes, it really doesn't fit, right? Yeah, it would have been nice if they could have crippled it a long time ago, uh, their yeah. knowledge of it and their use of it somehow, you know, because they had the mycelial deals and whatnot. They they could have done something to where they just lost their connection to it altogether. And it would have been that simple. But uh, has space aids. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so Tilly, ugh. This says uh, discovery will always be one of a kind. And, uh, you know, I was saying to my wife last night, discovery is an absolutely ugly ship, dude. Just but ugly ship for all the Starfleet ships I've ever seen. Well, you put a note in in there uh, and it, it's it does feel very disjointed, right? Like everything. Uh, oh, doesn't, yeah. Doesn't feel like it belongs to the same thing, right? Right. Well, because all their new ships now are all disconnected from all the parts are disconnected. So, you know, I, I hate that. I absolutely I hate it. It's so weird, man. I mean, uh, like even DS9, you, you have like different parts of the ship, but it, it was always pretty obvious that it was part of DS9, right? Yeah. I mean, like I want to see stuff connected, man. I mean, dude. Like, I know it's in the future. You've got force fields that are really good, and people can just transport from one piece to the other. But, you know, I like to see walkways. I like to just see traditional connections or whatever. Uh, I don't think you get so far in the future that that's just a ridiculous thing to have. So right. I'm just calling kind of bullshit on that whole design theory, uh, transforming ships and all that bull. Uh, don't like it. Don't care for it at all. Um before we get out of that scene, Saru tells his girlfriend that he's had an offer to become an ambassador. So he got some thinking to do, and uh, she wants him to do it on his own and not oh, factor her in. Something that happened uh, last time we broadcast, I, for some reason, called Saru a Selkie instead of a Kelpie. <laughs> Kelpie. Uh, and that's kind of because those two, they're both myth mythological things. Yeah. Uh, Water-based. So, well, I mean, it happens. Hey, man, listen, we <laughs> we ain't all perfect no matter how hard I strive right. for it. Um, anyway. Yeah, so we end up in the Infinity Room with Dr. Kovich, played by David Cronenberg. Is which, it? Uh, that is the David Cronenberg. So I didn't know what he looked like. So I didn't, I've been wondering who the fuck this guy was, but I just never yeah. cared to look him up. And I saw that and I was like, oh, oh, okay. David Cronenberg. Oh. What I was going to ask is, uh, have we seen the Infinity Room in Star Trek? No, this is a new thing. Okay, that's why we got the whole explanation of what it, you know, what it is and how he, you know, uh, it's a bit too over dramatic for his taste type deal. Um, so it's a room, basically a secure room. It's it's basically a traveling hollow deck, ultra secure hollow deck. I life. mean, it's the same thing as an Invincible and a number of other franchises. Yeah, yeah there's there's been all kinds of versions of it. Yeah. But they they made a nice little infinity like a clear glass looking. I'm sure it's not glass, but uh, infinity looking symbol, and it looks like there's a piece of mercury in there, type rolling around in it. It's pretty neat looking. Uh, so Admiral Vance and Burnham are in this meeting with Kovic, and it he goes through just like I said, and uh, about its security and what it's like and whatnot, and he talks about an 800 year old Romulan science vessel. And of course, I immediately, right there as I'm watching the episode, doing the math in my head, here he's up. Yay! Up. <laughs> it's TNG. <laughs> Yay! I'm so excited. So, um, yeah. So, Dr. Kovic, though, man, he ain't saying shit. He ain't giving up nothing because, uh, I mean, I guess. I don't remember. See, uh, again, this is this is me not knowing enough about it. I guess have they ever said Doctor Kovich is like Section Thirty One? I mean, I haven't seen it, but I also did not watch the last season either. So, yeah. So, I don't know. I I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that he was the last remnant of Section Thirty One, and I'm sure now, uh, at least, he has people that work for him or whatnot. Maybe he doesn't, but. He may be all that exists of that. And maybe they're like the Sith. They only roll in twos or in singles or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I could definitely feel the seeds of the Section 31 show being planted already. Yeah. For sure. Um, 
And then we get to our next scene and we meet Maul, played by Eve Harlow. And speaking of Sith. Yeah, speaking of so thank you. And and Locke, played by Elias to, uh Jesus, Tofexis, I guess. Um I, I don't know. I Tofexi? Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh but yeah, the, the, these so what is it? This is like the right? third it's, one, right? Yeah. We got a new well. archetype of at least so we have what's her name from um Shen? A- Acolyte. Oh. Uh, no, yeah. not Acolyte. What was the show we just uh finished with Star Wars? Ahsoka? Yes, Ahsoka. That girl. Yeah. Is one of Shit. them. Yeah. What you said. Yeah. And uh it seemed like we had just another one recently. Or maybe you I just know, brought it up time. because it was this girl you brought up and that I'm thinking Figuring of. that out, but this person looks a lot like her too. Yeah. Um so I don't know what gives there, man. Apparently they think this is a, a hot commodity. That this is what's appealing to Females, I guess, or or and males. I don't know. I don't know. I don't either, but it's definitely a thing. Yeah, I mean, you recognize it's a thing, right? It's not just me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it's it, it's so it's like a short blonde hair, insolent, um, mousy, or, or like what mousy. I call a spinner. Yeah, like yeah. You, you can plug in all of these obje- uh, adjectives, and they're gonna fit. Uh, this one, Shin, and whoever that third one is that we can't figure out. Yeah, I know there. It seems like there is one that we've seen recently. There is, uh, but you know, we'll figure it out sometime. But yeah, I mean, I'm not necessarily against it. It just kind of feels like it's something somebody's trying to push somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. It's like it's like some weird agenda that's just so out there. Yeah, you know, it has no point other than well, I'm sure it has a point to somebody. Uh, but yeah, we so we meet Maul and Locke, and and they're a couple of couriers, and they're already on the Romulan vessel. So they, in which we knew that was going to happen because they had little foreshadowing of the fact that that could happen. <laughs> and already I'm ticked off again because they break start using the word shiny. Shiny. Which where did they use it at? Because I I remember it, but I don't remember it. Uh, well, I mean, it was uh, Locke talking about whatever they were coming after, and then he called it a shiny. Oh, he called it a shiny. Or he okay. said something. He actually didn't call it a shiny, but it was like a reference to... Something similar. Firefly. Ah. You know, they use shiny to be like cool, neat, whatever. And ah. he kind of dropped it. And I mean, I'm all for paying homage to that kind of stuff, but it really doesn't feel like it fits in Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, And then... Kovic's insistence that they use whatever force necessary in this mission just shows how big a deal it is because we still don't know what is going on. We just know it's a big damn thing because um, Red Directive and all, and it seems it's already got an air of being something huge. So right after this, we get the titles, and when we get out of the titles, we find... uh, when they find the Romulan's body, that Owasar, God, I, Owishikon, is that how you say it? Owishikon says, so. uh, 800 years waiting to be found. And I was like, uh, no, I don't think he's been waiting around that long. He, right. he, maybe a couple hundred years, yeah, because they, they live a pretty long time, Romulans, but not 800 years. So I thought that was just a weird, a weird comment for him to make. Um, and then, of course, we see the Maul and Locke have tricks right off the bat. They're they're ready to come. I knew they were there. We knew they were there. I'm I don't know why they uh they should have well, I don't know what kind of tech they think they can come against now that they still have that backward mentality, even with all the new tricks and stuff they've got. Would they have anticipated something like that? Like those little personal bubble shields and stuff. Well, I mean like they, somebody should have known, right? Yeah, like, somebody should have. Hey, it, we got this kind of tech before that point. Personal, uh, personal. Uh, uh, shit, Jesus Christ! Brain fart. Um, Force field. Cloak. Personal Fuck. cloak and all that yeah. stuff. You know, I don't guess they were ready for that one. So. Uh, 
yeah, that's why I was saying in my notes here, 32nd century tech is very convenient. Uh, you get sucked into space like she did, and boom! All of a sudden, you're in a space suit, and then uh, we we uh, pick up uh, where she where we started with at the beginning, and she gets to surf on the ship as they make their way out. And so now we know the, who the ship belongs to at the very beginning, to Maul and Locke. Yep. Uh, and I'm yeah, not they, sure that that played out right for me. You know that it's a common trope of like you know starting and then backing up to explain where how you how you got to where you're at yeah yeah but i don't know it, it i don't just know if it was necessary yeah i don't know if it was necessary it was obviously just there to get us excited right off the get-go yeah just grab us and and put us in a situation right off the start uh, instead of just kind of slowly bringing us back to who everybody is and all that stuff and you're right it is a common tool they use um i guess it just wasn't high enough stake for me maybe yeah so, I mean, as if that 32nd century spacesuit wasn't cool enough, you know, they got those cool-ass wrist replicators and the holographic AR com badges. I mean, dude, they, I, I, it's cool because I wonder how, how do you uh, best the tech of TNG that we're used to, you yeah. know? Uh, so it's, it's interesting that they definitely had some good ideas. All right, so we, uh, we catch up. Burnham's on the surfing ship, and uh, it is a cool ship, by the way. All of a sudden, Captain Rayner shows up in the USS Antares and puts the tractor beam on the ship, and Berm's like, what the fuck's going on? And they get back and forth, whatever going on. And, uh, and really this forced... is kind of new territory for us, right? No, see, that's what, I, not last season, it's exactly the same territory. So you said you didn't see last season, so you don't know that this is becoming a thing now. If if, if we knew that Discovery was going to go on, I would expect this every season from now on. <laughs> the the captain that nobody likes, you know? Well, no, I wasn't uh, talking about captain. that. I was talking about, like, all the ships this close in proximity, in warp with one of them oh. pulling a tractor beam on another. Absolutely, dude. Yeah, I, I have a real hard time. This... These so far, the, these two episodes. I don't know if it was both episodes, I guess it's all in just in this episode. No, no, yeah, it's all in this episode. They did so much crazy shit with ships. I, I'm just un crazy about it, man. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, having, having his ship like right in there, man, you know, warp bubbles collide and whatnot. She's in there inside that warp bubble, and then she's fucking with warp bubbles, you know, trying to knock the engine out. And the bubbles, do, you know, disintegrating on her. I mean, it's just like, come on, guys. You got to give me a break with this shit. Get a little that, more realistic in my science idea, fiction. Yeah, the whole idea that they sent off, what was it, 12 other beacons? It's kind of ahead. Did you have more you wanted to go over this section before I get Yeah, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, it's clear that Raynor has, Raynor has a hard on for these two. Like he's been right. after him. He says he has been one for a while. Um, we see that L and K use more tricks. I say L, but I say L and K. That's not L and K. I'm calling them L and M, by the I, I way, from now on. That. Yeah, um, because Lock and Maul, it was just easier to write L and M so much because you talk about them so much. So if, if I mention L and M, that's what I'm talking about. So L and M use more tricks. They, they do what Brian was saying. They fire off all those uh, 12 to 20 whatever little bombs, warp, warp trail bombs, yeah. right? Um, and I just love that fucking line when Captain Rainer comes up on, on the bridge of the ship and says, that cherry they just dropped on our shit Sunday left us with 20 warp sign signatures all sh uh, charting different courses. Right. And, you know, because she was all about, oh, well, we'll just track their warp signature, no problem. Man, she's clearly not dealt with the people of this of this nature before, for sure. Well, I, and that's what I was kind of getting to. It, the, it, it seems like the showrunners went out of their way to make it seem like, yeah, it was literally no problem. I mean, yeah. there's more that we have to get to into the story, but like, you know, once the, they answer this one call, it's like, bam, we know exactly <laughs> where they went, right? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And then on the bridge, back on the bridge, Kovic says, this is the part where you tell me you have a brilliant idea. And of course, right, it's got to be Booker. Of course. The perfect person. No one saw that coming at all. Um, yeah, just totally. I mean, we just saw two couriers, Booker's an ex-courier, a lot, a lot, a lot. 
You can figure that one out. So we're back in the shuttle bay, and Burnham is waiting for Booker to show up. And, of course, the writers have interjected more awkwardness between the two because they have to use that new formula. They got to keep it sappy with feelings. And, buddy, this is this is kind of like the reason I, I realized in this episode why I dislike Discovery so much. Um, it's those feelings, the the oozing of emotions, the self-exploration stuff. It's just constant, man. It's it's not just sprinkled in like a chef would just sprinkle in a fine ingredient here and there like they're supposed to be. It's just constant fucking shit all the time. Let's talk about our feelings. And, and it just seems to be such a modern way of doing things, man, that I just don't care for. So a similar thing happened with me on this episode uh, uh, as to I found out why I don't care much uh, for Discovery. And it's not so much that. Uh, obviously, th- the whole thing with Discovery is they're, they were trying to attract a new audience, right? Yeah. That's kind of the idea. True. Uh, but for me, it's uh, I am not one to stand on decorum, right? You know this about me. It's pretty obvious I, I think it's stupid to ask people to dress up a certain way to go to like a funeral or a golf course or a number of other places yeah but that's what it is there's the 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 decorum for a spaceship is lacking right yeah and and the spaceship can't run if like this is going on with all the crew members and I'm not necessarily talking about all the feelings and the sappiness. I'm just talking about like, you know, people want to get upset or show their ass or whatever. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's very far removed from the military uh, aspect it had previously. Right. It was very rich in Naval tradition before, and they seem to have distanced themselves as far from that military aspect as they possibly could yet still not take away from what it is, you know, at its core. Uh, I agree. And I hate it. I mean, just sick to death of it, man. Uh, that fucking Tilly (laughs) and that skinhead girl, man. That's I can never remember her name. So she's just that skinhead girl to me. I just can't stand those two of them. They're the worst with their feelings. Always wanting to talk about this, that, and the other thing. Ugh, it was it was a lot of torture because Tilly's been gone. Tilly was gone for like most of the fourth season, yeah. and it was nice. And now she's back, walking around, looking pregnant in her giant fucking Star Trek smock. Yeah, it's bad. Everybody else has a real nice fit and smock, and hers just makes her look like she's pregnant. And I thought it was, you know, I, I saw another shot where it, I got a similar look. Uh, from some of the other females and the way their smocks were designed. So it's, she's not alone, but she's one of the main offenders as far as the, the main cast anyway. But uh, anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> um, yeah, we we kind of had we, a, a big thing. Let's see. Yeah, well, we joined yeah, them walking yeah, and talking in the corridor. To the one thing I that, wanted to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we joined them talking and walking and talking in the corridor there, and there's this triple. Yeah, walking up the bulkhead, and I'm like, what, 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 what the to fuck? Me it was too obvious, right? Like that there wasn't enough substance in the conversation, and they weren't framed in enough for it to be kind of one of those things where most people miss it. I'm pretty sure everybody freaking saw that. Well, yeah, and, and then he falls, makes a noise, and rolls off down the corridor down the side, and that's and, all we see. Yeah, and I'm, but see, I'm just like, we know how fast those fuckers can multiply. Right, and I'm like, why is there a triple loose on this ship? What the fuck is this? Some 32nd century century triple that's been uh, domesticated? Is, if I recall correctly, somewhere they genetically modified them. Ah, well, that changes things a bit. But anyway, I had to draw attention to it because it didn't draw enough attention to itself. I don't think. <laughs> right. That was being facetious, y'all. Um. Burnham, Booker, Admiral Vance, and Dr. Kovich are in briefing, and Kovich still doesn't want to give anything up, but they know they're looking for a Tan Zekran. And that's, you know, like a little puzzle box, puzzle basically. Box. Yeah. yeah. You know, Chinese puzzle boxes are very famous uh, type deals. Uh, and of course, Booker knows the only person that L&M might sell to 
is named Fred. Just Fred. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like that. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, and as everyone leaves, Burnham and Saru stay behind to talk, and both are surprised that even Admiral Vance is out of the loop. You know, uh, that, that that even heightens it for us even more. We're already like, wow, this is a big red, you know, red objective or whatever the fuck, a red directive. And uh, now even Admiral Vance is out of the loop on this, one, which we already had that feeling. I, I was, I'm surprised they were just now talking about it because it was clear early on that he was out of the loop to me. Maybe maybe it wasn't that clear. I don't know. No, um, it felt pretty clear to me too. Yeah. So. Uh, in that exchange between Saru and Burnham, he suggests that she get access to different databases because she mentioned that she could not find any kind of information about that Romulan, about, you know, his name, even nothing. Uh, so. Burnham does get the not so subtle hint about Tilly and. Uh, we get a whole excruciating scene with Tilly in her maternity smock and some potential love interest that we will most as, almost assuredly see in the Starfleet Academy show. And they're flirting with each other. Yeah, do you agree he, he's got to be one of the cast members? I'm sure. Uh, yeah. If not, then he'll be like one of those recurring ones. Right, right. Where right. you won't see him like, you know, every episode or every other episode, but eventually he'll, you know, come into the scene and it'll be a big yeah. deal. Right? toy with her emotions and then yeah. leave her for a few episodes, yeah. And uh, I got to ask, how long was Tilly fucking drunk for, dude? Seemed <laughs> right. like she was drunk for a long goddamn time. Like, I, I don't know how long it took him to complete that mission. Uh, but they they did, they completed that whole mission and then went and picked up Booker, had their meeting, you know, and, and then she's still drunk fucking with this dude. That well, seemed I mean, awful fast. It's possible all of that can be done in a day. And it is possible that Tilly was doing a little day drinking. Uh, yeah, well, if I were her, I'd be day drinking too, no doubt. <laughs> I can't stand that girl. Uh, so we join Burnham, Booker, and Raynor are on the desert planet and village, not too far off from being very much like Tatooine. I first said Tatooine, but after I thought about it a minute, I was like, you know, actually, the village looks way more like Jakku. So yeah. either way, we're still getting a Star Wars ripoff planet, no matter how you look at it. Um, I mean, and it, it, go ahead. It, it, it's kind of hard to to make a desert planet and not draw some inspiration from that, right? And yeah. I think I think it's not as, as painfully obvious as it could have been. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It wasn't terrible. I just you know I had to make the comparison. Yeah. Uh, so L and M come to Fred's to sell, and we see that he appears to be what looks like a an android, right? I assume android. We think we don't know for sure. He just looks very looks much very like much data. like a, a very popular android we're familiar yeah. with right yeah looks just like data um and it's an interesting take man i gotta say it's definitely an interesting take on and finally seeing somebody else other than brent spiner right. um because he was he and I, they may have been very deliberate about it but they he was very different from brent spiner although you know we assume that he had you know when data got all his emotions, he was quite human like. So I'm sure that's this guy had all the bells and whistles. Um, so he was very human like, even so much to say that he gives the he gives his uh, self away. Yeah. <laughs> they asked Fred if he can open the Tan Zakran, and he does. And he makes an offer that L and K don't like, and the deal goes south. He does get a very good look at the diary though. We didn't realize how much of a good look he got, but he got a very damn good look. And uh, well, I mean, he did the Android thing, right? It was just, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So. He just thumbed through it, and of course, you know, every time he looks at something, he's taking a mental picture. So uh, the note I had here Will, was how fucking shitty a shot was he, dude? Right. I mean, he is an Android man. Honestly, he should have been boom, boom, you're done. I mean, I realized he had a fucked up uh, disruptor or whatever that was. Was that the was that the a Romulan disruptor that was in the box too or something or no something I he had I, something he had on hand. Well, I I couldn't I I couldn't figure out if it was just an old disruptor that wasn't working that, that was in among in amongst the stuff. And that that may be it might have been amongst the other stuff that they plundered. 
Yeah. Uh, and so I couldn't figure if it was that, that it was old or that they had some kind of dampening field or something on them. They kept it from working. Of course, then the other stuff fired and I realized it was probably just old, but he does get another phaser obviously of some kind and he shoots her, but I mean, just a shit shot. And with his, he should have incredible speed, right. And be able to have incredible accuracy and boom, boom. So I call him bullshit on that. He should. Well, I mean, dead. it is, it is 32nd century. There probably were protocols that had to change that kind of stuff. Right. Ah. Uh-huh. Ah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Could not be as strong, as fast, or as smart as they were in the past. Yeah. Make it, it, I'll give it to you, bro. It makes perfect sense. So I'll let them have it as well. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. So we get uh, Stamets and the doctor looking into Fred. Mm-hmm. Who uh, has a serial number AS dash zero five seven two Y, and they AS for yeah they they wonder <laughs> and the AS is for Alton Soon and Jesus y'all it's it sucks because we do have three different Soons to deal with three is it just three it might be four no I know if, yeah it, I think it's three I think it's three three different Soons we got to keep up with. And I did look it up for y'all's behalf, so y'all, y'all would know. It's the 24th century soon from Picard. Right. So it was one of his designs, but not built by him. So obviously somebody, he had licensed the tech or whatever, or, or the Chinese had stole it or some shit and just built their own. Something to that effect. Yeah, but, and uh, as far hmm. as I know, like, n- nothing else came of Noonan stuff, right? Like, a, Like, some of his stuff was maybe referenced, but... Like most of his materials were lost. Nobody wanted to do anything other than data and lore was, I can't remember whatever happened with lore, but I assume he was destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I remember right, he was, I could have told you so easily back in the day. Right. Same. Yeah. Anyway, they, uh, they talk about the Android being old and still using wires, which they need to replicate. But of course, Stamets being, one, a man, and an engineer or just someone who likes to tinker, uh, he has a stash, which I kind of really loved that, and that's why I'm pointing it out, because that is a very guy-like thing to have. A box of wires, uh, a thing, a jar full of nails and screws or nuts well, yeah, and bolts. yeah, but the wires is more like tech. Like, a guy or a girl, I don't think it really matters if you're, like, a tech head. Yeah, you're going to have, like, a that's box true. of cables, a box of wires some old stuff that you don't really use anymore. Hell, I've still got some coax somewhere around here, and I haven't used coax for anything in years. Yeah, I just threw away a bunch uh, a couple of days ago helping my dad. Yep, sure did. We have, and, and what we were doing was emptying two tins full of uh, wires and shit, speaker yeah. wire, fucking phone cables, LAN cables, coax cables, you name it, it was in there. I found a old USB uh, uh, 802.11B wi-fi adapter <laughs> nice. so you know uh yeah we we that that little stash reference was very cool yeah so anyway uh rainer clocks the l and m on uh, l and m on sand runners and all three give chase that's booker rainer and burnham give chase yeah. and then we're back on there was we start doing this kind of flip flop thing we're on the ship we're on the planet blah 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 so we're back on uh with tilly yuck Hacking into a database with 256 qubit shifting fractal encryption. And I bet there is actually a lot of real tech in that title under the qubit, but they probably added the qubit for quantum, right? Quantum computing. So that's why the qubit reference is in there instead of 256 bit. Uh, Most of that's real fractal encryption, all that shit. Yeah, that's real stuff. Uh, she gets busted and Vance decides to see what she's trying to find. He says, just a shame I didn't bust you quicker. Right. They find to a holiday. I didn't catch you in time. I yeah. Really yep. Very common thing we see. Um, they find a holiday of the Romulan, Dr. Valak, detailing everything that was in his diary. Yep. Now, we got a little bit of history for you guys. So, those of you who don't know and weren't alive back in the TNG <laughs> days, you may not have even seen TNG before. Dr. Valak is a character from a previous TGN, uh, <laughs> TNG two parter called The Chase. And uh, it's an episode where Picard's old archaeology mentor, Professor Galen, shows up with an old artifact that triggers this intense quest that Professor Galen had been pursuing his whole life. 
And this was the thing that was like a Russian nesting doll kind of, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it kind of uh, it had the big base. It was very large, and you, you pull the top off. It was in two halves, and it had a it bunch had a of bunch tinier of dolls. Than- yeah, kind of in a circle type deal all in there. I don't think I that like the Matryoshkas or whatever, I don't think they opened up the little ones inside. I don't know for sure, but they, they did just nest inside. There. And there were quite a few of them, right? Like about right. 20, it seemed. Because uh, it was quite like large, right? About yay big, as, as size, he said it on the size desk. Size. Yeah, so uh, Picard forms a tenuous alliance with Klingons and Cardassians as they, as they too seem to be looking for the same stuff. So they've already uh, got an idea about this as well. And uh, they uh, end up beaming down to the planet Vilmore 2, where they find the Romulans have already beaten them all there. Right. And uh, Valak was one of those Romulans that were there on the planet. He was actually the guy in the very back. If you ever see a group photo, of him, <laughs> he's the one in the very back. Um, everyone present is equally privy to the information revealed by a hologram of an ancient humanoid played by Salome Jens, who y'all will remember played the um, shapeshifter, the, the female lead shapeshifter in Deep Space Nine. She also uh, played a role on Enterprise with similar progenitors, I believe. I, I want to say that that's what Enterprise was alluding to as well, the, the progenitors. And so she's played all three of those roles. It's interesting to note that all the faces look the same. I was thinking of that. I never really picked up on how the progenitors look like uh, the shapeshifters. Shapeshifters, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's interesting to note that. Um, and their, uh, their race seeded life throughout the galaxy, so all humanoid species share a common ancestor, which Star Trek Disco- uh, Discovery dubbed the progenitor, so that's added now. That's something right. we didn't know back then. They didn't have a name for them, at least, that we know of. Um, and this kind of mm-hmm. sparks something interesting uh, with the Romulans, right? Like this is before the whole Spock storyline that we had in TNG, where he was. Yeah, on the Romulans that was. Let's see, unification was in season five, and I, you know, I actually don't know what's. I can't remember what season this came out of. I want to say it was season four. So yeah, that might have been possible. I think it is. Like all the time, and, and it's. There are other points that touch on this with the Romulans back in TNG, and I'll I'll, I'll try and be brief here, but uh, we're always taught that these are just insidious uh, humanoids, right? Because yeah. they have the intelligence of Vulcans with none of the scruples. Yeah, and they're um, and they're very paranoid. Yeah, uh, but so often we see there are always these little outliers here and there that mm-hmm. are more interested in the Federation and what other races have to offer them and all this other yep. stuff. And that's kind of a big deal here. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, so the Klingons and Cardassians dropped the spirit of cooperation that led them to this point, balking at the idea that they're related in any way. But right. the Romulans, who essentially copied the Federation's homework to arrive at Vilmore II, contact Captain Picard with the hope of an alliance between the Romulans and the Federation. This implies Valak had been in contact with the Federation while leading the search for the progenitors technology in the 24th century, because in Discovery's 32nd century, Dr. Kovich already knows what's been classif- classified for centuries. Right when telling Captain Burnham about Valak's discovery of the progenitor's technology. And so the progenitor's technology is Star Star Trek Discovery's greatest treasure because it holds the answers to scientific and philosophical questions about the nature of life as we know it and also has the power to create life essentially from scratch. Uh, Which calls to me, of course, TOS, right? Yeah, I thought of Genesis Project. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought of, too. Yep, absolutely. Um, the sight of the progenitor technology could explain the ancient humanoids' motives beyond what was revealed in Star Trek The Next Generation, fundamentally altering societies at their very core. With that kind of information and the power of creation, the user, the user of progenitor technology could become the most powerful force in the galaxy, especially if the power to create also holds within it the power to destroy. Yep. So. That's a nice little history lesson right there on who Valak is and 
before we get out of that, I just want to say that I very much appreciate the connection to TNG, but they essentially start their own chase. Yeah. In this whole season, they did it in two episodes back in the day, and they're going to do it in a whole season. Uh, the Romulan and Star Trek Discovery Season 5 uh, Red Directive. Did I wait? Did I go? Yeah, I understood the importance of keeping information about the progenitors and their technology as secure as possible. Balak attempted to keep the location of progenitor technology out of the wrong hands by keeping a paper diary, which can't be hacked, and hiding that book within the Romulan puzzle box itself within a cloaked vault aboard his 24th century Romulan ship. Even then, Dr. Valak's diary isn't say, isn't the treasure itself, but a clue that kicks off Star Trek Discovery's galactic treasure hunt, which, like I said, was this modern version of the chase. Um, and is destined to change the galaxy irrevocably. Now, after talk of that chase, we're back to a different chase, like I said, of uh, L&M, Burnham, Booker, and Rayner are in hot pursuit of them on the sand bikes. So Rainer takes off, and long story short, thwarts L and M's because there's this whole back and forth where they're riding and they're, you know, it's again just like the the beginning uh, episode. Or I'm sorry, at the beginning where they're bickering back and forth about him backing off and stuff. It's the same fucking shit again. Um, so you know, they're foreshadowing. They're painting a picture of, of you know how how they are with each An other. Adversarial relationship. Yeah, yeah very much so. And um, Rainer uh, thwarts L and M's exit into the tunnels that are under the mountains because they say that uh, there's all these tunnels under there where they could they could go forever and find a way out and escape, and nobody would know where the hell they came out at. <clears throat> so he decides that he wants to block the planet with debris, so they can't even get in there. And here's and, what I don't get: like they made this big deal about like there being a thirty percent chance. They're going to blow up this thing, destroy the settlement, all this other stuff. I, I still don't get how during a hot pursuit, the two couriers pick up on this idea, right? Yeah, they're not right. getting on comms with anybody. Exactly. They're just trying to get away. Yeah, and, because and it, that's what she says. Know. She's like, how did they get the idea? Right, yeah. I'm yeah. with it. Like, how? Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> of course, I... Now, see, I'm 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 a cold dude, but like I'm all about the mission and whatnot, and that's the way Rainer is. So that's why I like Rainer so much. He's very much how I would be, and I I know how important this mission is. I know how big a deal this red directive is. So big a deal, it was kept well a secret, and uh, collateral damage is just an unfortunate, you know, part of it. It's not something you want, but it's something you have to accept, and so. I would have just said, fuck it. You know, do what you got to do. And that's what they were told to do anyway. So I kind of call bullshit on this whole saving people thing. But I understand this Federation of Starfleet and we're in the we're in the modern times where everybody's touchy feely and wants to be sappy and stuff. It's called risk assessment. And generally, if it comes down to like every living thing in the universe versus this one backwater settlement. They got to go. Armed forces are not going to go for the settlement, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No matter which country they represent. So, yeah, they end up. Um, they So, yeah, like you said, Locke and uh, Maul find out that or, or, or blow up, cause a big avalanche. And she's like, where did they get the idea for that? Blah, blah, blah. I told you they would do that. Basically, is what she's saying, and uh, so they get the the Antares and Discovery in this second of the most unbelievable bullshit situations. Um, this was just mind bottling. I'm telling you, just so stupid, dude. Uh, to me, what it calls to mind is somebody watched their kid playing with like two starships and a sand. Yeah, right there. yeah. <laughs> You got it, man. Yay, it's saved. Come on, guys. Give me a fucking break with that. So yeah, they 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 put the ships down in front of this big avalanche and have their shields on. And I mean they're they're basically dived into the sand, it looks like. And it just it makes my brain melt. 
with some of the stupidity. I'm waiting yeah. like so many things we've seen in the past that happen like that on a much shallower approach were yeah. so much more destructive, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, just look at the Enterprise D, dude. Oh fuck. It didn't take it too well. Now, granted, it didn't have shields at the time, but whatever. I'm just saying, you know. Still, y'all get it. It's it's bullshit. So when that that whole thing's over, we get a moment with Burnham and Booker where she basically says they ain't a thing no more. And then we show up back at Earth, and Discovery goes into space dock as it should after that ridiculous maneuver. Right. Uh, and then Saru and his Vulcan girlfriend immediately have words, and 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 it's. A very, very long scene, excruciatingly long scene. But uh, she basically asked him to marry him, to make a long story short, uh, in a very Vulcan way, by the way. Yeah, it's not because she like, never actually me? says that. He has yeah. to actually put the words out, and she agrees. That exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we end up joining Burnham in the sick bay, and Stamets and the doctor show Burnham what the android saw which was everything in the diary, like I said. So uh, they had a complete record of the diary. So they see they need to find a planet with twin moons. And she reckons it's the Valene system, sorry, the Valene system. And uh, she says she needs to go talk to Kovic. And she immediately transports us into that meeting. She tells Kovic what she knows, and it doesn't really phase him one bit that she knows what she knows, and he still doesn't want to give her any more info. Yeah. After a little bit of back and forth, he decides to read her in and tells her everything. And uh, then Burnham claims to have found a planet that she thinks fits the bill, and he throws her an infinity key, and boom, the end. That's the end of episode one. Yeah. That is all, buddy. So uh, without further ado, I don't think we need to dwell on anything. Is there anything you want to add to it? Um, I would say, I think because there was so much lacking in the action, the, like the action scenes in this episode yeah. would play a big part into why they did the one and two. Yeah. That's all I got. Probably say. so. I mean, yeah, it's, it, but it seems to be like a new thing we get in a lot of, especially, uh, it's not just the Star Trek guys, it's the Star Wars guys too, doing it the same way. Um, I, you know, I would rather they do a two hour like intro episode like episode one is two hours or an hour and a half or whatever right just to uh, basically like two episodes day, right yeah Longer right opening and finales yes you're getting a two-part episode but you're calling it episode one and then episode two is just you know standard 45 minute or whatever the hell they use nowadays <laughs> It was always interesting to have that kind of thing back in the day, especially when you had a group watching, because you kind of had like intermission here and there, and that that wasn't necessarily fit into uh, whatever you were watching. So you'd go out for a smoke or get something to eat or you know whatever. You'd step away and you would come back and you'd be like, "Hey, what I miss?" Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. I do miss some of the uh, some of the ways stuff used to be made. I like some of the modern stuff, but it, you know. I just miss, and when I go back and watch the old stuff, it makes me miss it. But anyway, without further ado, we're going to move directly into episode two, and it is entitled Under the Twin Moons. And uh, we start with Burnham staring outside the ship window and listening to her log entry when Saru enters. And we get a shot of a dot cleaning the sand off the ship from the previous episode. Right. And uh, which I like. I like to see the dots whenever I can, because that's something that I, I really think that I would have enjoyed seeing during the TNG era, because they right. were there was something like that there, whether it be man, you know, maneuvered uh, B worker B hmm. um, something would have been around. Yeah. So. Um, and during their talk, we learn that this will be Saru's last mission before he leaves to become an ambassador and get married. So uh, it's interesting. I guess we're going to lose him for about three or four or five episodes and probably join up back with him at the end, I'd imagine. I don't know. I, like, I'm going to drop this before you get to it because this is where it sent off my spidey sense that I was like, Okay, one last mission. They're going to kill Saru. Well, that's right? what my wife said. 
Yeah, that's what was in my notes because I didn't claim it. My that's all my wife, and she she did. She came right away with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and you know pencil her in for calling that one, and we'll see. And you too, and we'll I see totally how it goes. I expected him to be like mortally wounded or something during this particular episode, but I still kind of feel like, despite this being the last season, they're kind of laying the groundwork to take him away from us. The one, the one, the person one person that we I like. like. Yeah, the and literally the only person I like for sure. And, I just, yeah. and that's funny because I did tell my wife that yesterday. I was like, that's the only character I freaking like. <clears throat> but anyway. Before they get underway, however, there is a little matter of an inquiry into Captain Rayner's actions on Kumal. Burnham doesn't say too much at first concerning her colleague, but Rayner tells her to be honest, and unfortunately for Rayner, she does. But the inquiry is held in recess for the moment, and nothing really goes on at that, and everybody moves on, continuing with their thing. So Vance and Burnham are walking from the meeting room and talking about Rayner, and uh, where we learn that, that he and Vance are pretty close, and uh, we get a little more of Rainer's background, um, you know, and what kind of a little more about what kind of guy he is. That he, he he's definitely a good guy for for the yeah. Federation and has their best interests at heart in that in that regard. Anyway, so um, as they're walking, we also learn of an additional crew member who'll be joining us. Gee, I wonder who this could be, um, but they don't tell you who it is they just kind of dance around it and then vance finally asks burnham if there's going to be an issue because you can see it all over her face to which she says no and immediately there's like a little twitch on her cheek so you like she even knows she's lying right then and there um so we know that turns out to be a lie very quickly which there was another thing that took me off about the writing here and it was it was about at this point that i picked up on it they dropped the ball on vance's character this is a guy who normally plays bad guys yeah, everything I've seen him in, right? Yeah, and yeah, you know, when I first saw him as Admiral Vance, I was like, "Cool, we'll give him give him a shot as something else. Let him expand his horizons." I don't feel like the writers gave him that the leash he needed for that. Well, when I first, when we first met him, I thought he was a complete asshole, and I really didn't like him at all. And he play he was playing that character he's the most famous for playing, pretty much. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, I like him toned down for sure. Uh, I don't know. I don't hate it. It's not bothering me too bad. But I get I what you're seem, saying. His character seems kind of bland to me at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. So, um, we're now in Booker's quarters, and he sees a hollow mouse going around on the floor. That is, as he turns around to find out, is being operated by Burnham. And we have to endure more back and forth between them because this is this is one of those other gushy things but the the thing that annoys me is like they were fine and then of course they had to make it to where they're you know at odds again because it has to pl- play out for the rest of the season just more plot device that's just annoying to me um but it's all business thanks thankfully because i was really scared there for a minute yeah. but it is all business uh where she fills him in on the plan basically and there is a moment where the business fades though and it becomes a little playful and grudge is a beautiful main coon by the way very nice agree. looking cat i love main coons um so we arrive at the planet lyric at the edge of the beta quadrant in the valeen system an uninhabited planet that is home to a large necropolis built by the promillions a species first mentioned in uh tng and now extinct Burnham, Saru, Tilly, and the skinhead. What's her name? Tal, I think is her name. I, I can't uh, recall. I think that's her name. Tal are looking at the planet and their uh, landing location when Tilly says, in true Star Trek fashion, that they can't beam them right where they want to go because of an electromagnetic field. You know, how inconvenient. Uh, so they'll have to so walk. So stupid. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, that really, yeah. that it, I, mm, Yeah. Saru and Burnham arrive on the planet Lyric to find it beautifully serene and Saru notes very quiet. They see they must go towards the pyramid there out in the distance. And uh, yeah, I guess it's quiet because it's basically, you know, it's a necropolis. So it's necropolis, as quiet yeah, as the dead. Yeah. Which aren't very quiet, actually. Um, we go back to the ship where Booker enters the sick bay and the doctor gets very huggy and very nosy, really. He wants to know all about what he's up to not what he's doing right there in the moment. And uh, 
And he proceeds to give details, which he has none, about Maul and Locke. Booker watches a hollow vid of L&M's first escape and says that they are having fun and they're in love. And you, know, you kind of see him almost having a little flashback to him and uh, his days running around with Burnham and those things. So, yeah, he, he, he misses her for sure, which seems important to him, you know. Uh, we find out that they're thrill seekers, basically. So Booker wants to give them a metaphorical cliff to jump off of. And this is part of that drama that we're probably going to be seeing this season. You know, that uh, the the two couriers kind of being a throwback to Booker and Burnham in the Amen, past. brother. And then being different people now. And all, yep. like, we know how that dynamic is going to play yep. out, right? Damn, Skippy. You're right on it. Um, on their way to the pyramid, Burnham tells Saru he has a nickname, Action Saru, a nickname known to Saru and given to him by, it turns out, Commander Reno, who I don't remember seeing unless she was at that party for a split second walking Man. by. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I want to see her. I love Commander Reno. She's really funny. Uh, great comedian. As they continue walking and we have to put up with more gushy shit. They find some old skeletons and wonder why, you know, what had attacked them. They're, you know, they're on a dead planet. What could possibly be killing off people? So back on the ship the again. The guy, I'm sorry. The back drop for, you know, foreshadowing. Yeah. Is dead. Yeah. A lot of foreshadowing going on. Uh, back on the ship. This is another one of those ship, planet, ship, planet deals. Just like at last episode. Back on the ship. We deal, deal with the uh, Tilly towel moment. Uh, yeah, and it's just pure yuck. It's 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 the gush of all gush, and it, <laughs> I would just cut it out of you know. I, if I was so inclined to make my old videos like I did back in the day, cutting out the commercials, like stuff I would record off TV, off cable, and then cut out the commercials and stuff like that, uh, I would have I would have cut their whole scene out for sure. Yeah, I think this is kind of so. There's this this thing uh, in media right now that is very important the viewers and that is senses of sincerity and things that they've missed out on in their familial and friendship relationships yeah and sometimes it lands i think guardians of the galaxy 2 i saw not a single dry eye in the theater when it was just uh chris pratt and um why am i drawing a blank zoe kurt kurt russell oh, uh kurt throwing russell. a baseball okay. back and forth uh, that simple. Almost yeah. every guy who had a bad relationship with his dad cried. <laughs> yeah. And no there's doubt. a lot of that. Uh, and I kind of feel like more often than not, Star Trek, and there are other franchises I won't call out at the moment, but Star Trek really kind of misses the mark. Yeah. They they really do. There There's a couple in the old days that get me. Uh, like the, one for... Um, Star Trek Nemesis, the movie when Picard fucking goes off, breaks all his yeah. ships. That one always tugs at me, man. I don't know why, but it does. He he really sells it. But the, that's that's a sign of a great actor. Sell him. Sell him well. well. I don't even know his great acting, but the the episode with Lull. Uh oh yeah. Kind of for sure. Stringy, right? Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah. They would they did it a lot better to me back then. Star Trek did, anyway. Um so meanwhile, back at the ranch, Burnham and Saru come across a statue with four eyes. Uh, those eyes end up holding four attack drones. They get attacked, and they have to evade the drones for a while, as Tilly claims to be trying. This is where it kills Brian and I right now. Tilly claims to be trying to make it so they can transport through the electromagnetic field. Right. Well, if you could fucking do that, then why didn't you just didn't do you it do in it? the first place? <laughs> God <laughs> damn, dude. Talk and, about and I'm out. I the only one, or did you you also expect when you saw the the drones kind of like moving in those eye sockets? Did you expect the statue to like get up out of the ground? Well, I knew the eyes were going to open. I could already tell that they were animated, like right. they had the look. And uh, it, it's like watching the old cartoons back in the days. You could tell what stuff you see was going to move. Was a different color. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, they just had a slight look to them, uh, and maybe that was deliberate. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I knew they were going to open. I and I wasn't sure exactly. If it was going to be a whole big statue, like a Jason and the Argonauts type thing, uh, or if it was, you know, it ended I think up I being, would have preferred that, right? Yeah, it would have been kind of neat, you know, but then how the fuck do they get out of that one for sure? Yeah. I don't know. 
But uh, yeah, that was some really shitty writing on the part there. Uh, to, they could have come up with another way to keep them from getting close. Uh, you know, if they were going to rely on this electromagnetic thing so much, which we're about to find out, they scramble around for a while until uh, Killy can come up with the location of the power source. And then Rainer shows up to help uh, help both Tilly and Tao uh, the get their minds focused. Tao, right? <laughs> yeah, man. Get focused on the tax, task at hand and think like the people who built the tech. Uh, and then Zora, the ship's computer, figures out that uh, it's electromagnetic waves that power them. And Tilly tells Burnham what's up. Burnham and Saru what's up. So Burnham okay. realizes it's the head of the statue the drones came out of. And uh, while Action Saru gives her the chance to do it, Burnham overloads a couple of phasers. He does throw out the, the darts. Yeah, he does the Action Saru dart head. And uh, Burnham overloads a couple of phasers and throws them in the uh, eyes of the statue, a couple eyes of the statue. Not before and, she pulls it out as it's overloading to shoot one of them, right? Right, yeah, yeah. She's <laughs> got to come back for it. And uh, Which, why? Right? Can't she just yeah. replicate another one? Yeah. I got to find out, man. There's got to be some kind of like energy limit or something, right? Maybe. Please, please, writers, write an energy limit in there. You cannot have an unlimited fucking wrist replicator. You just can't. You can only have one one gun from one repl replicator at a time, right? Possibly. But um, <laughs> yeah, so she spewed two out. I don't know if it was his and hers or whatever, but she had to. Yeah. Um, but we've seen them do multiple ones, so we know that they can hold more than one. Because, yeah, as a matter of fact, right after that, they spew two out, each one of them, right after that happens, because they don't have any weapons. Um, so they make it out okay. Ultimately, Saru gets a little injured arm, and then his little neon thing keeps blinking and driving me crazy throughout the episode. Yeah. I'm like, somebody fix that fucking thing! <laughs> uh, we join Stamets looking at the diary and trying to figure out what that little diagram, that little drawing is for. And uh, Booker comes in wanting to use the comm so he can get on the dark web, basically. The right. uh, 32nd se uh, century version of the dark web. And uh, he lends, lends, he sends L&M a message. And uh, he gets an answer. Not very long. And then we end up back on the planet again. We go back to Saru and Burnham where they find a very large stone. Kind of like a small obelisk. Would you? Is that a right term, really? Yeah. Um, it's not very tall, not a very tall obelisk, but it's just a large four-sided kind of... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, and it's also not very pointy, which I usually right. associate with an obelisk, which I don't know if that's necessarily I don't correct. know if they have to have a point. They might be able... I don't right. know. I really don't know. But it's it's just shaped. It's a big stone shape, you know, about the size yeah. of two people standing next to each other. Um, so uh, they find that there are glyphs on it, and the glyphs have carbon residue from where L and M tried to make it unreadable with phaser. Right. So Saru using his alien eyes, because we see they go in a tight shot and his eyes change to their uh, focus. What do your alien eyes see? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sees that there is a iridescent bacteria that's growing in the grooves on the glyphs, making it readable with certain image you know, within certain imaging wavelengths. So, uh, the problem now is they find out they're running out of time because the electromagnetic field is charging back up and they only have about four minutes, three to four minutes left before they got to get the fuck out of there. And so they, they analyze, yeah, they get a count. They, uh, they analyze the glyphs and realize that it's a Romulan rev lab, which is, uh, basically like a poem. And Almost during an like hour, haiku, but definitely different. Yeah. That's what I got. Cause they, they recognize that it has a certain amount of lines, right? Um, cause during analysis, they realize they only have four of the five required lines to be a full rev lab. Just like, you know, a haiku has to have a certain amount of syllables. What is it? 19? Uh, well, if I recall, it was, uh, yeah, maybe. 19, I think it's 19 syllables. I thought it was three lines, five, seven, five, but it's I, yeah, time. I don't know. Fuck dude. I'm not Japanese or a poet, so I couldn't tell you. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so back on the ship. We see Booker and L and M conversing. Booker and L and M talk a bit about, and oh, I'm sorry, talk a bit, and he tells them who he is at the end because he's kind of cagey about it at first. So Maul appears to know Booker's name and claims she and Locke only need each other. 
Right. And Booker is visibly shaken, for sure. I mean, you can't hide what's on his face. Something's up. So, uh, back on the planet, Saru and Burnham realize there's got to be another inscription somewhere. And uh, through deduction, and I think with the four lines they have, they realize it's up under the giant stone. And Action Saru starts up again, and he pushes the stone away using his fucked up arm at the shoulder. It looked like, didn't he, didn't he push yeah. with that shoulder? Yeah. It looked like it. Yeah. Should have used the other one. Um, and they find the last line under it and a stone looking object, which right. they uh, remove at the last second before beaming out and they're saved. Back at the ship till he talks about how Rainer helped them figure out the deal. And Burnham is shocked that he helped. Right. Uh, they ask Stamets to join them, and Burnham orders uh, the dots to be sent out to repair all the damage that happened on the planet. And it just seems like I'm noticing that they're going out of their way so far in this series, this fifth season, to point out how caring they are and, and respectful they are and all this stuff, because... I just don't know that it matters, does it? There's no fucking buddy there. I don't know. I mean, like, that's the thing with any type of art, right? Like, so many people want art to be pure escapism. But so many artists know that there's a lot more that they have to put into it, right? Yeah. Like, representation is always a big deal. And, you know, some people will be unhappy about it. But really and truthfully, if you are a good writer, if you are a good artist, if you have the chops, it's not going to be a big deal, right? Yeah. There's going to be enough substance to carry whatever you're trying to do. And that's, that's what we generally feel like we're missing out on is substance, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Stamets, Stamets arrives, and Burnham shows him the stone, and he examines it for a second, and then Burnham asks Zor to make a strange matter version of the diagram inside the diary. And once complete, Stamets sets it on its side and then realizes almost in an instance that it's part of a multi-piece map of sorts uh, broken into five pieces, which kind of, guess, fits in with the poem, right? Five lines of the poem, five pieces to the map. Right. And um, the poem tells him where to go next and search for the other four pieces. Again, a whole new chase has started. And what will they find? Will they get it all? The technology of what created them? I don't know. Saru suggests the next location is Beta Z, where LM must be heading. But upon further reading, they believe it is Trill. And so now we're in Booker's quarters and he's reviewing the hollow vid of LM. And he has Zora de-age Maul, and upon doing so, he recognizes the girl. So he's sure. Yeah. Got a and, little flashback to his memory. Yep. Some time has passed, and we hear the door chime, and it's the doctor. Booker proceeds to tell the doctor about how he knows who Maul is. She is the daughter of his mentor, Cleveland Booker IV, which makes her the closest thing he has to family, and her name is Maline. Ma is that right? Yeah, Maline. I, think um, so. I suspected they were going to do this. I don't know right. why. I just had a feeling that they were going to make him his daughter somehow. You know, I, we don't need to explain how. It's just I figured they would find some way to wedge it in there, and it was just a gut feeling. And uh, and then by the way, but Booker mentions a birthmark on Maul, and that's the only one he's ever seen on one child. So that's how he figured it out. And I'm like, what fucking birthmark, dude? Yeah, I have. Right. I, I'm sure it's there, right? But I mean, like. It's I, subtle. It's not like we think of birthmark like a big, like e either intensely like a berry dark or intensely or... black area, right? Yeah. Like a hairy berry or a fucking, yeah. you know, brown spot or something like that. Yeah. Noticeable. Um, Sometimes, you know, there are just like these little red marks or whatever, you know, and it's, it's right. so minute. Like, yeah. You know. I just thought maybe she was dirty. Or, I mean, well, we know she's human. I don't know. She's wearing a lot of makeup or whatnot. She, right. Yeah. I don't know. It was lost on me that it was a birthmark. So I Same. guess that's why maybe they pointed it out. I don't know. I'm with you. So um, back at Starfleet headquarters and Burnham is making the rounds. I mean, literally making the rounds. This is all Burnham going to see people. 
Uh, we were in Saru's quarters where uh, he and Burnham share another excruciatingly long, sappy moment before he leaves for a few months. And I'm, like I said before, I think we'll be without him for four or five episodes, maybe less, and uh, bring him back in before the grand finale and it's all done and Discovery flies off into the sunset. But now Burnham's uh, made it to Admiral Vance's quarters and she asks Vance about the inquiry and Vance tells her that he asked Rainer to take an early retirement. Burnham talks Rainer up a bit and Vance tells her that the world has changed. It isn't for men like Rainer anymore. And we're left with a tight shot on Burnham before we cut to her now walking into a room where Rainer is. Yep. And uh, they talk back and forth. She ultimately offers Rainer the first officer seat, which I did see coming. Not not the first episode, but about a quarter way through this episode, I realized he was the first officer. And um, she tells him that he has till 0800 to accept, and he essentially accepts on the spot before she even gets out of the doorway. And uh, <laughs> he calls to her and he says, I'm not a yes man, right. and zips up his uniform and sings. Says yes. <laughs> That's it, buddy. <laughs> oh uh, yeah uh i liked the episode it was a pretty good episode you know minus the stuff like you know we talked about so far i'm in man i mean like i loved like i said in the last episode that it's tng connected yeah. so i'm loving it uh they they knew they hit something when they had the last picard season it had so much tng in it they knew they oh, yeah. hit a fucking uh, big thing. So the fan base like was very vocal about it, right? Yeah, they were very yeah. smart to bring this in, man. We need that. I mean, we're the ones watching. Yeah, you're bringing in new new people and shit, and that's great. We want y'all here, and we want y'all here definitely. Uh, but we're the ones fucking that know Star Trek. It's our show, and those older than us. So. They're listening, and I like I that. Know. This like, is from a time when we were around. There was a time where there was a, a, a great rift between TAOS fans and TNG, and like that still ex exists here and there. Yeah, and maybe I, for some of the older fans, but shit, dude. I'm like, fucking, look, come on, come all, dude. We're all one big fucking happy family. We'll even take the Discovery people. We'll even take the Lower Decks people, man. You know, I don't have to watch it, but y'all can enjoy it, you know? I don't know. I mean, are people actually watching Lower Decks? Last I heard I, it hey, more they're boring. four seasons deep, man. I don't know. <laughs> How do you get four seasons deep if nobody's watching it? Who knows? I know. I, actually, I think it's because, it, you know, it's probably not doing so bad because it does, you know, it's not a standalone thing. It It is being tied into universe, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's there's definitely Trek, the Trekkies. There are Trekkies out there, as you well know, for watching everything, no matter what. Yeah. And I, it's like I told my wife last night, just animation in general for me, and, and you're about to freak out when I say this, is just not my bag right now, bro. I don't want to watch animation right now. I mean, overall, I mostly agree with you, but that's just because so much animation I, I is is not visually appreciated. Uh, appeasing or pleasing jesus yeah well these. and it's almost like that they that's their that's their out for taking the cheap way out instead of doing the right thing and giving us like a babylon 5 live action show they'll give us an animated show or something like that you know it, well to, i mean for the trying to appease time, the fans but it's not what they want yeah for the longest time you were able to do things in animation that you couldn't do in live action and that line has shifted but it's still much easier to do in animation, much yeah. cheaper. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I just feel like their heart's not in it. I'm like, well, thanks for nothing. I mean, I, yeah. Like the fact that Star Trek is such a rich, you know, world and universe and has so many different shows. I, I'm fine with lower decks being around for someone. I mean, that's right. no problem. It doesn't take anything away from me. Uh, it, well, Except when you bring him into live action, that gets just stupid. That was a little weird. That, that was kind of silly, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was the most fun of episode of that season, it turned out, didn't it? We both liked that one a lot, ultimately, yeah. which was kind of weird. Yeah. 
But yeah, it is what it is. Anyway, guys, we have kept you for so long because they insisted on giving us two episodes right off the bat. And dude, it would be stupid to put two episodes on YouTube back to back. You're just gonna kill one of your episodes, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, for us, especially a small little little channel like us, that would just absolutely be a, a nail in the coffin. So this is how we have to do it. We hope that you guys made it to the end, and we thank you for so much if you did. Uh <laughs> We thank you so much if you did, not for so much. Um, right. But uh, anyway, we're going to see you guys in a couple of days on the podcast. And uh, and uh, do we have a day that we're picking out for these yet? Or oh, well, I am. There's. I just feel like I want to make sure this gets done justice, and I don't want to cram it all in tonight. So I'm going to take the better part of the day tomorrow. It will be out on Wednesday night for sure. Wednesday night. Maybe earlier, maybe even Wednesday afternoon if I get through with it quick enough. But Wednesday night for sure. Future episodes because we're going to continue oh. to do this, right? Or is this yeah, just... no, I I think we'll stick with this. Yeah, yeah, we'll record yeah. it when we record it, and you'll put it out Wednesday night. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep, so sounds keep an like eye a plan. Yep, you guys keep an eye out for it. And in that meantime, as always, be excellent to each other. And Brian and I will see you on the flip side. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Peace out. Get out.